professionally. Sorry. Yeah, is being recorded. <laughs> so Julia is the debut author of the internationally best-selling novel, Disappearing Earth, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Um, she's a Fulbright uh, Fellow, and Julia has written for the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Paris Review, and she teaches at Randolph College, um, the MFA program, and lives in Brooklyn. So with that, I would like to introduce Julia. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. We're so excited to have you. Like I told you before, we've all the staff has been reading your book and we've been chatting about it. And, and we have so many questions and so many things we want to talk to you about. One of our local book clubs had actually chosen the book back in the winter as their book club selection. And you that's how kind of you came onto our, our radar a bit. So um, it's definitely one of those books that, that uh, book clubs are picking up for sure. Lots to talk about. So um, it's a good thing. Um, but you have a really interesting story and um, I did want to find out from you and we ask a lot of our authors like how did you come to be a writer just um, how did this come to you is something you always enjoyed doing um, tell us about um, how you came to writing well it was definitely something I always I always enjoyed reading I loved reading I loved books um, I bet Nadine and Brianna you you guys run across a lot of folks who say that um, I, as a kid, I, I loved to read and was so immersed by it and so swept away by it. And I was very lucky to have um, teachers when I was younger. I think especially my second grade teacher, I remember particularly, who encouraged us, their students, to write and to tell stories. And to my second grade teacher would assign um, short stories as homework. We had to write. And I would write really bizarre and <laughs> <laughs> um, visions <laughs> for, for my homework. I remember one about a girl who shrank and I think I must have just seen Honey, I Shrank the Kids. Mm -hmm. And then she fell down a, a garbage disposal and then she was chopped up and then her dog ate her. And I turned that in and my teacher said, great, what a great job, Julia. You have <laughs> such a great voice. <laughs> and and I, think, I think I was so lucky to be, um, by the way, you're hearing a little Brooklyn outside the window, I think. It's okay. A little street noise, a little ambiance coming right down the block. <laughs> I think I was really, really lucky to be um, encouraged and supported at uh, and empowered in writing and in um, art making and storytelling in a moment that was so pivotal, um, not just as a second grader, but just as a young person. It, it made such a difference. Um, and kind of the biggest difference I can imagine. Um, and when I, so when I was little, I thought I want to be a writer. And then I uh, didn't see any reason to get off that path. People kept supporting that, that dream at the moments I needed that dream supported. And, um, and it makes me think a lot about how important that is, how important it was to me. And I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at all the books you have in the back there too. And as, as you said, like Brianna and I, you know, we're book people. We love book yeah. people. I see all my favorites back there, Matilda. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I loved we, Matilda. I know we were both uh, children's librarians, also Brianna and I. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So we do. We, when you were talking about with your writing teacher and how important it is, and how important you know that inspiration is for younger people, we yes. believe that too. And that's wonderful to hear. And look at you, you know, um, you know, now here we are talking about your book. Like that's just fantastic. So it's very exciting. Um, this story in particular, Disappearing Earth, your debut novel, is a, really, a, it's described as a crime novel, and it is a crime novel, um, but it's written in a very particular way. Um, what inspired you to write this novel, this crime novel, in an atypical fashion? Yeah, so, I mean, just as you say, it, it's a, a crime novel or a thriller, um, ostensibly. <laughs> it, yeah it is framed around or it starts with the, the disappearance of these two young sisters in this community in Russia. Um, and that's not a spoiler. It's on the back of the book, you know, if, in case anyone hasn't read it, like that is not new news, I promise. Um, and 
then we kind of follow the, the investigation over the course of the year. But what the investigation looks like is not, um, we're not focusing on a, a detective and a, mm -hmm. you know, tracking down one perpetrator. We're kind of looking at um, a whole community of people. And so each chapter is told from a different woman's point of view, a different woman in their community. Um, so it ends up being 12 different women's stories. Um, there were a few things that, that pushed me toward that structure. Uh, one was that I was writing about this place. For me, the story came from this setting first, from this particular place in Russia, the Kamchatka Peninsula, where, where the story takes place. Um, I was really, really interested in Kamchatka. I was a student of Russian and I wanted to learn more about Kamchatka and, and I um, had always wanted to be a writer, but I kind of used the idea of a book as an excuse to get to this place and keep practicing Russian and, and keep learning. And so I really wanted to cast a wide net in whatever story I would write. I knew that I wanted to have sort of as, as, um, as broad of a focus as possible. I wanted to have as many characters as possible from as many different backgrounds and ages and some people from the city and some people from the villages and uh, different um, sexualities, different experiences in order to sort of um, give myself an opportunity to learn as much as possible about the folks who were living there. Um, I also, I'm very compelled by stories of missing I'm gonna say missing girls, particularly. Stories of missing girls. Um, that is a story that, which is what this book is, story of missing girls. That is a, a kind of, that's a trope or um, a kind of shape of a story that has been as compelling to me when I was a little kid reading fairy tales as it was uh, you know, when I was in high school reading tabloids. Um, I don't know, I only said in high school, I still read tabloids. Um, <laughs> or, you know, when I like, I love to listen to podcasts, but I love to watch Lawn or SVU. I, I, I like that, um, I like that archetype in some ways. I like that structure of a story. And I think after a while of ingesting that same story over and over and over again, um, so often the story of uh, like a little white girl in peril, um, you, you kind of inevitably start to think, what about this story is so compelling to me? What about it is, uh, why do I have this appetite that this is both feeding and not satisfying? Mm -hmm. um, what is it in me? What is it in my community? What is it in my culture that wants to tell itself this story over and over and over again? What is the purpose of this story? Mm -hmm. um, and to me, uh, what I wound up with that when I was writing this book was thinking about how a lot of times we tell ourselves that story to kind of pull attention from. Uh, that story is the story of here's this freak thing that happens that has nothing to do with any of us. This, this bad person comes out of nowhere and can, and can steal your little white baby away. And, uh, and it, it has nothing to do with um, how you treat your neighbor or how they treat you, or um, it might as well be, you know, the wolf gobbling up Red Riding Hood. Mm -hmm. And that is a comforting story because it, it doesn't reflect reality. And that's not only a story in fiction, it's, a, it's that's the story we tell her, you know, that's a story in news articles. That's like, that is repeated over and over again. And that actually the way that harm is enacted is is a range um, of which something like something as rare as a child's abduction by a stranger is like the most visible kind of top of that range. But there are so many different harms that underlie that and uh, make a foundation for that. And we teach each other uh, how to hurt people and who it is acceptable to hurt and who, if you hurt, gets a lot of attention and who, if you hurt, doesn't get any attention, um, isn't even seen as hurting anybody. We do that all in community. And if we do that in community, we can help each other in community too. And so I wanted this, this book to be about a community of people 
who act together to make not only this event, this crime, but, but harms like this, uh-huh. everyday harms possible, and who can also act together to, to heal and to address it and to recognize what's going on. Um, to me, that felt much more like, like reality than, um, than Sherlock Holmes. I love Sherlock Holmes, yeah. but you know, it, then, then um, Sherlock Holmes like having incredible deductive reasoning and seeing exactly, you know, the, who what the answer is. Yeah. Um, I have like so many different like I have a question in my head, but I'm trying to like formulate it because VD and I before we got on we were talking about community and like there's a question that I would like to ask you to the end, but because <laughs> I'm like ooh, now because it's touched upon it. So it yes, you did. Which you know what? Let's just let's just do it. Let's do um, it. For um, one of the things that was like written from like your publisher was that this powerful novel brings us to a new understanding of the intricate bonds of family and community in a Russian unlike any we have seen before. First off, it's so interesting that as an English major, you were able to take your studies into Russia and make, I don't know if that was a I think you said that was like you wanted to go to Russia, so you kind of made your your major kind of like satisfy that need or that want, that yearn for you to do, which is really cool. But um, my question is, you're talking about community and um, I, women's identity, responsibilities. There's just so many themes here, and you really do challenge the idea of the of, I guess, a very correct me if I'm wrong, even Nadine, just how we think about Russian um, identity, how they're like what they, Russian beliefs and all because of what we were taught about um, Soviet Russia. So was this something you knew you wanted to kind of write about as you studied and stayed in Kamchatka? Is that right? I was so right. I was so right. Um, I was so correct. Thank you. Because um, it's just, it was just so interesting that is yeah you you really are challenging um, a modern day, well a, a perspective of Russia that we don't really consider. Was that something new for you when you went to Russia? Well, you're saying like witnessing like wow there's so many parallels um, from my home country that's also happening here. Can you talk some more about that? Yeah yeah absolutely. So so I came to so I so my like main ambition always was to be a writer really sort of creative professional focus on that mm-hmm. i had a i had a hobby i would say or like a sort of obsession abiding interest in russian language specifically and russian literature russian culture history um kind of from teenagehood on so in 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 college i like minored in russian so i could go to moscow and study for a semester and like you know travel around and blah, blah. you know I was very enamored very 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 enamored with Russia um part and so so I wanted to go back to Russia um to Kamchatka specifically where a place where I've never been because I really wanted to um that obsession hadn't really run its course I, I wanted to dig further into the the Russian thing um my, my own roots of and try to figure out what was going on there. Um, I had this theory about Russia at the time that actually I, I don't think I hold so much anymore. I think it's changed a little bit, but at the time this was that, that uh, I was studying Russian, you know, mid 2000s. I went to Moscow in 2008. It was this moment of sort of like, um, the reset and and Putin, you know, momentarily sort of stepping back from the from the spotlight in some ways, and Medvedev coming in, and Obama, you know, coming to the stage here in the U.S. and and it was this moment of sort of like shift and optimism and this sense of you know perhaps we're moving out of you know the legacy of the Soviet Union to the to past like the post-Soviet period, even to something that is new, some, some new um, moment. And it was very exciting to be studying Russian at, 
the time, you know, my, my classmates and I were all very excited. And, and we all had this sort of chip on our, our shoulder of like, well, no one's talking about this enough. You know, no one's talking about Russia. Everyone thinks that Russia is old news. Everyone thinks Russia was relevant in the 80s, but like no one is, you know, kind of having this conversation. Um, and so the theory I had at the time <laughs> was that, was that uh, the US and Russia are like siblings. And um, sometimes I talk about like two, two sides of the same coin, but I like siblings um, just because, you know, my, my own, like I have an older brother and that relationship was so, is so important to me and the book's about siblings, you know, and so like that, clearly that's a sort of core analogy I always come back to. But, you know, growing up in my house, there were just the two of us siblings and we um, defined each other we defined ourselves in opposition to the other one. So one person would say, oh, I'm the smart one, so you must be the dumb one, or I'm the cool one, so you must be the uncool one. Or, you know, we were always trying to um, differentiate ourselves, like really in this binary relationship. When, and then in fact, we were growing up in the same household, same parents, same conditions, same, like we were so similar to each other. And I see Russia and the US, at least in my, um, in my education as an American, I kept having the sense that, or the, the feeling that I was being taught Russia as, as our opposite or, you know, on this binary, like, um, you know, we are, we are capitalist, capitalist and they are communists. Like we are good and they are bad. And like, we are free and they are constrained. And then I was going to Russia or in my Russian classes, and the the teachers and the people I was talking to were saying the same thing about the U.S. And I, and meanwhile, these two countries were were behaving in much the same way and with the same desires of militarization and of um, violent oppression and of um, the desire for a sphere of influence, uh, the the kind of conception of of nation as superpower, these were so common, um, but they're so shared between the two places. And so when I went, I had the idea going into this book that I wanted to put down or, or write in there what to me had been so surprising and interesting, which was that this, um, this is a country that is not like a cartoon villain in a Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoon. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is our sibling. Um, I'm like, what, what's your sibling like? Like, what are you like? What, what are we like? Mm -hmm. um, I also, when I went there, ended up, um, Kamchatka is a very particular place, a very particular place. And I, I do think Kamchatka is a Russia unlike many of us have ever seen before. Um, it's, it's just as far from Moscow as you could possibly get. It's, it's on the Pacific coast. It's kind of like by the tail of Alaska mm -hmm. uh, in the Bering Strait. It is um, really distant, uh, really geographically and historically politically isolated, um, kept isolated by the state. It, it has an incredibly rich history um, and self-conception that is not the same as the rich history and self-conception of, of Moscow or St. Petersburg or, or Western Russia or uh, European Russia, quote unquote. Um, it's something that is itself. And I wanted as much as possible to try to put that in the book too. I hope that answered your question. I'm worried. <laughs> did and it, you, you're just giving me there's just so much to pull from I'm like okay where do I go from here that's um, a nice way to say I'm, I'm talking too long <laughs> no 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 because you're it's there's so much because now I'm also thinking and Nadine you'll probably agree that you're picking this you're talking and Nadine you used this word before you said universal themes and what's cool is that you're using women as this voice to kind of echo echo that. Um, so my next question is, you know, there's been so much ongoing protests in developing countries concerning women's rights and even in the US and, you know, affluent countries as well, um, women's rights, identity, and so forth. 
has that all um, has that framed your your work while you were creating Disappearing Earth? Has, has that did it affect you? Um, and did you also? I guess my question is because I kind of we wanted to go into um, what was it called? The you you were volunteering at the Crimes Victims Treatment in Russia. So did that like align? Well, that, well, that was so interesting. Okay, so excellent questions that are like so so much for me to even think about. I hope I can do them justice. Um, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> Good, no problem. <laughs> Uh, well, I, while I was working on this, I was writing this, I would say, I started, I proposed the project first in 2009. I went to Kamchatka for the first time in 2011. Uh, and my second research trip was in 2015. Um, I would say I finished, finished writing. Um, I feel like my air quotes here. Um, I in the beginning of 2017, like January, 2017. Oh, wow. um, so a lot of the conversation of the past few years, um, the bulk of this book predates. Okay. Uh, I, and <laughs> the conversations that certainly in the US, um, we've been having around around violence, around sexuality, around culpability um, and complicity. That has taught me a lot. And, and those are um, ideas and subjects I wanna push forward in future work um, because I think I've learned a lot from, from the conversation that we've all been having. I think in this book, without a doubt, a lot that's in there is from, um, you know, just the experience of like growing up in our bodies and, um, you know, like prior to like Alyssa Milano publicizing the Me Too mm -hmm. um, hashtag or, you know, put like sort of bringing it to, um, Twitter's attention in that way. Uh, I think all of us have had um, the experience of, of, I think every woman I know, uh, every girl I know has had the experience of, of living in a patriarchy and um, understanding in many, many ways, the hierarchy that is in place and, and what um, harms will come to you from that and how to try to work inside that and you know survive inside that and flourish inside that if possible but that that is um these are our lives and that is something that i i i hope is not <laughs> i don't think the experience of, of living in the patriarchy is, is necessarily universal i hope i hope that there are places that are not uh, not like that. Um, Russia certainly is a patriarchy, a patriarchal society. Um, the U.S. certainly is, and um, I, I, I wanted in this book to put in. I love what you both said. That, you know, like universal themes. I wanted. To, I think all of us are human. Uh, all of us, you know, have, um, you know, like. If you cut us, do we not bleed? You know, all of us, all of us have um, yeah. pains and hopes and dreams and and desires. And I wanted to put that in the book, but I also really and at the same time, not but and at the same time, I really want uh, I really wanted this book and I really want my writing in general to talk about what it feels like to exist in in your particular body in a space that that body is seen as um, less than or mm -hmm. threatening or, um, you know, how, how our identities shape who we are, our bodies shape who we are, how other people perceive us, um, our family relationships are, you know, that, that is a really the kind of the, the most compelling possible 
subject to me. Um, and so I wanted, I wanted this, this book to, to look at women, look at women's experiences, um, reflect women's voices and, and show many different women coming from different places um, of different ethnicities, like, and how their experiences do not overlap with each other. <laughs> you know, like all of them are um, struggling with this hierarchy in, in very different ways. You asked about the Crime Victims Treatment Center. So that is a place that I worked at. I volunteered at prior. It's in New York, it's in Manhattan. And it's a wonderful organization. Um, I uh, volunteered there for many years, kind of overlapping with the period that I wrote this book. And then I worked there um, for a couple of years before the book came out. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a victim services organization that, you know, plug for anyone here, you know, like all of us in New York, it's a New York, uh, you know, based organization. All, all. Mm -hmm. So it offers um, free services to survivors of violence. And those services can, you know, can range from you know, trauma therapy to um, giving you a cell phone. If you, you know, are in a DV situation that you just left, you don't have a phone or <laughs> um, like a t giving you legal advice or all sorts of different things. They're really an extraordinary extraordinary organization. Um, and I volunteered there in, as a, a sexual assault and domestic violence crisis counselor in emergency rooms. So they have a program where um, volunteers, community volunteers are on call in emergency rooms to respond to folks who are coming in. You know, um, we're not doctors obviously, or, or police officers or lawyers or whatever we are in our day-to-day -day lives mm -hmm. in this capacity you're just there to be a supportive you know so someone doesn't have to sit alone and say what's going on why isn't the doctor I don't know what's happening you can sit with them and say if you want to know where the doctor is let me run and go check mm -hmm. um, very sort of like just there to be of service make it a little easier um, as as easy as a, a horrible time can possibly be yeah <laughs> um, and then when I was working there I was coordinating that that volunteer program um, that experience of working there, I think was probably the most, remains probably the most um, shaping and formative of my life so far. What I said before about a range of violence, how community participates, you know, and how violence is a spectrum. And that is fully uh, a pretty explicit lesson of, you know, I can even like, I think point to the slide in the volunteer tra training that says like, this is a spectrum of violence, like at the top are physical acts of violence that they're, they're under, you know, under like, like, you know, that the base is like, um, jokes about, you know, like homophobic jokes. And like, you know, that is how that, that the, the way that we speak to each other casually, the attitudes that we hold, um, support the, the physical violence, the physical harms that we commit. Um, I also, working there, volunteering there, um, showed me a lot of, I think the biggest thing it taught me that um, shaped this book so much and that I think shapes all my work and kind of my whole uh, existence mm -hmm. <laughs> is that you, there's not a thing you can do to control someone else's choice to hurt you. Um, there isn't a way you can be, there isn't a right order of operations. There isn't, um, if you just don't do that or watch yourself this way or are very polite or dress correctly or um, keep a good job or have a lot of money in your savings account or if someone else decides to hurt you, Someone else may decide to hurt you. I mean, like, you, there's, that's, that's it. Uh, so there's nothing you can do to avoid it. There's nothing you can do to uh, keep yourself uh, immune from it as much as we might want to for ourselves and our loved ones and, you know, our children. And like, and so what happens then? So, so then the task becomes not like, how do I avoid harm? Mm -hmm. It becomes, how do I um, acknowledge what has happened uh, and heal Find, find some healing. Um, 
people are going to hurt each other. We're going to hurt other people. That is really um, kind of an inevitability or, or at least something that uh, like on an individual level, we can't control, okay. um, but we can uh, support each other or recognize each other or say like, I see what is happening. I see what has happened. And, and that, you know, this, this, what has happened doesn't have to like vanish into the ether as, as an insignificant thing. I recognize this and actually um, in surviving, we can uh, we can feel better together than we knew was possible. Um, that, that there's, there's such action, there's such beauty um, and such goodness in that. Um, and I didn't see that before and I didn't know that before. And, and I think to me, that is what the book is about. I think that's what life's about. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what life's about. So interesting. It Um, it really is. And and I'm just thinking about all these characters that I read and all the individual stories. And I know when we were talking about it, you know, some stories were more relatable than others, of course, but that's what I loved. And and some of the attitudes of the women were more, you know, relatable than others. And then also the friendships in in some of these stories that happened that we weren't expecting. And um, I did have difficulty remembering everyone's name, but I sort of loved that. And I loved that you put the, you know, the family, the families in the beginning of the book, because I referred back to them all the time because I wanted to get to know their interrelationships and how, you know, how they came to be with one another. Like you said, it really is this interwoven community of people that makes this foundation upon which these two girls just disappeared. Well, three that we know about in the book. And, um, you know, I think that that's what was so um, interesting for me was was these different women and their experiences um, and them defining themselves in these experiences also. Um, I'm thinking about the character and I'm not gonna remember her name but the one who had the, um, who went to the doctor in the hospital. Oh, yeah. I think that was my favorite story. And I read that and it was just, I don't know, somehow that related to me. And I just liked her story and her fear. Um, She was so alone that you could feel how alone she was in that moment. And it just, but these stories were just, they really were um, just fantastic. Um, was there a character that was like the most interesting for you to write or the story that had the most like, oh my God, you know, (laughs) cause that's how I felt when I read her story. Like for you, what was that? It means every, everything you guys are saying means so much to me. I'm just sitting here like, like, you know, beaming at my computer. Um, for me, my, my favorite, favorite, you know, my, um, the character like kind of that touches my heart the most is um, Xusha, who's the, the dancer in the December chapter. I love her. I feel very tender toward her. Um, I think that, so you, in this chapter, she she's sort of, um, she's in one, I would I would say abusive relationship. She's, she's in a very toxic relationship, um, long-term relationship and she meets someone else and sort of starts having an affair that is also she's like kind of torn between these two um possibilities i think when (laughs) i loved writing her point of view i loved writing her experience (laughs) though i i found that um especially writing the characters who were younger than me when i was writing it her character and um olia who's who's a 13 year old in the beginning of the book i think i in memory am pretty pretty harsh with myself when i think back on those times of my life um those ages and and i feel a lot of sort of um maybe even derision or contempt for, for, you know, the teenager I was or the sort of like 
And writing those chapters about those women, those girls, uh, made me feel so much more tender and, um, and loving toward that moment. Uh, and this experience for, for Ksusha, for the dancer, how she is, she's just like, she's just on the cusp of setting aside childish things. She, is, she doesn't know yet the power she has or the, uh, the capacity she has um, or the, the beauty she has. She doesn't know those things. And so she's still sort of um, feeling powerless or feeling like, oh, I just gotta kind of got to go along to get along. And, and she's just about to um change and and in this chapter even her you know beginning this affair is this like is this sort of step out toward doing something that she wants to do um that she never felt okay doing before um and that i found that really moving i find her really moving i i just like like her so much. There was an innocence about her that was yeah. heartwarming. Yeah, absolutely. But that she kind of teetered between the both, being so innocent and helpless and just so childlike. But then she also had these emotions that were so grown up. It was really a great capture of that teenage years, you know, um, in her story as well. That's really interesting. And and one of the other things that comes up in discussion when we talk about your book is the title. Um, disappearing earth and there's so many different and uh, you know uh, interpretations from us what was the title your choice because a lot of times it's not um, was that your choice and if so why is the title was my choice I I had it from the very start of the project and I kept thinking you know because I had worked on this for so long I had lots of opportunities to go to parties or dinners or people would say oh how's that thing you're working on like you're still working on that book you know what's it called and I would say disappearing earth and they would say what and I would say disappearing earth and they'd say it's about climate change and I would be like no it's not about climate change <laughs> but I felt very sure that eventually you know if I were lucky enough to find a publisher they would have some really savvy marketing person who would come up with the perfect new title. And it would be very easy to say at parties and everyone would say, oh, I know exactly what that's about. <laughs> I did find a brilliant publisher who had all sorts of brilliant marketing people. And we all talked about lots of different titles. And then they said, okay, this is, you know, this is what it's going to stay. This is it. Which is now I feel very glad about because there isn't anything that we found that speaks more to the sort of themes and ideas that, that, uh, to me are primary, which is, th so the titles from the, the whole book is uh, kind of bookended by this story of, of a tsunami hitting Kamchatka. Um, one sister tells the other sister the story of a tsunami that came and, and literally washed a piece of land away, washed a whole town away. Um, in the beginning, she tells her this story and it, and, you know, it's just like a scary urban legend. And then a couple pages later, they meet this man who ends up, um, they end up sort of being swept away by something that they didn't anticipate was something that's out of their control. And, and I wanted the title to speak to that very explicitly. And I also wanted to give a sense for all the characters of kind of um, precariousness or unsteady ground or a feeling that um, things here are going away and we don't know what will go away next. You know, for some people, they've lost their um, like a family member or, you know, their, their daughters or mm -hmm. um, everyone there has lost their nation. Like the, the country vanished or transformed overnight, just, you know, just 20, 30 years earlier. Um, there's so much uh, precariousness. And I wanted the title to sort of evoke that, that feeling in a reader. Um, I, I just wish it was easier to say it at parties. So I said it once and someone said disappearing girth. I said, <laughs> I said oh, that would be a great book. I don't, like, I'm sure I would. <laughs> I wish, I wish. Um, uh, one question is, um, especially with all the, the characters and the stories and the, um, the index of people that are, are in this book, my question is, um, would, would, I, not, I, would the crime have been solved 
if there weren't as many characters in this book? Like how vital were all these characters to this story? And yeah. Okay, I love this. I love that you're asking this because I this is one of the lessons I've had since the book comes out came out that the way I think of it is different from the way other people think of it. So to me, all of the characters are vital because in the construction of in in writing it, I tried to make it so one clue was in each chapter. One clue. Now I've come to learn when I say that people are like, what do you mean a clue? Like what is what clue is in the chapter? And I say like, oh, we, you know, we see that the detective has stopped the investigation. And they say, how is that a clue? And I'm like, in my head, it's a clue, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. like we, um, to me, all, all the pieces of the puzzle are necessary to sort of get a full picture of it's not only like the material clues or, or the or the um moment where they say oh my gosh we connected it and, and it's also the the red herrings and the um close calls and the moments that you think oh they could have solved it there but they didn't or oh it'll never get solved all of that um kind of creates the mentality that makes the investigation progress the way it does. So, um, and, and it's, it's the kind of mentality or attitude or um, collective uh, thinking about what's happening that, that's shaping the course of you know, what the police are doing or, or how emboldened the perpetrator feels or, and so everyone, everyone's part of it in that way. So I feel like they're all very essential. Yeah. However, I also think of the book as highly plot driven. And I've said that to other people and they're like. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have like a board, you know how like you see in like mis like Yes, like a crazy person board. <laughs> yeah, perfect. I mean, I can only imagine. So you, I can't, you, yeah. you, you had to have crafted this so to make it all like yeah like a puzzle make it all fit to create like this moment I, I did I had the yarn I shouldn't call it a crazy person for this number like a conspiracy theorist yeah. like kind of <laughs> yeah yeah I totally I totally did have yarn and string and little post-it notes I eventually started using a program a word processing program called Scrivener yeah that is a real game changer um, <laughs> I see you both yeah nodding like yeah. It's, it really, it really mm. is an incredible organizational tool um, and can't say enough good things about it, you know, for projects where in, instead of pieces of string and thumbtacks uh, <laughs> can make it a lot, a lot easier to hold all your wild ideas in one place. Mm. Do you have to cut any characters out? Were there any stories that didn't? I know you have 12 months, so I'm like, would you, it, and it makes sense, but were there any that you didn't, couldn't use that you had to cut out there weren't any um focus characters beyond these ones there weren't any you know chapters that i had to cut out um or you know kind of storyline thankfully maybe the limits of my imagination are such that i just came up with a number of ideas for the chapters i needed and that's it um i did collapse some of the secondary characters into each other in revision um, so, you know, some of like the friends, boyfriends, husbands, like they kind of like became, um, they were pretty overlapping anyway. So it, it worked much better to, to collapse them into each other and, and create a, instead of two half characters, we had one whole character that was much more satisfying. Great series. I would love to stream it. What is it going to be a movie? Have you, are they going to make it into a movie? Have you gotten anyone? Well, I don't know. If, that's how I think about it. It'd be great. Yeah. Uh, from from your mouth to, to Hollywood's ears. Let's see. Who knows? Imagine all these different stories coming together. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> I, just, I just thought about the cinematography. I'm like, <laughs> oh, that'd be cool. If, if it happens, we should all go on, on site to Kamchatka and yes. that'll be the thing. We can all advise on the set. 
<laughs> That'd be great. Oh, I would love it. Um, you mentioned some upcoming projects or something you're doing. What are you working on? What do you have coming up? Are there new novels we can look forward to? Or are you writing another one? I'm working on another one. I would say, you know, don't don't expend too much energy looking forward to it because it it's a long process for me. <laughs> you know, this one took me, uh, I think, ten years from from conception to publication. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I'm working on another one that has that's set closer to home, but um, has I think really similar themes of of um, power and, and violence and community. Um, I think those will those. I haven't scratched that itch yet. You know, I, I'm. I, it seems like that's always what what I want to talk about, and always what I want to think about, and certainly what I always want to write about. So, mm -hmm. that well hasn't run dry for me yet. Um, I guess one of the things. First off, I'm thinking just like, did you have to avoid like certain movies while you were writing, like, so you don't get influenced or like the story might change. Like, did you have to avoid like, um reading other crime mystery novels or movies um and the first thing i thought of was like you know gone girl like did you have to avoid like <laughs> no i gobbled up gone girl i okay. gobbled up gone girl um i did avoid yes the answer is yes and no okay. um i avoided books that i thought would be similar to what i was trying mm -hmm. to do okay so there were certain books that I felt like were going to be like role model books, um, mm -hmm. things that that were really, really similar. And, uh, and and like I wasn't in a confident enough place. I like call it confident, maybe superstitious. I just thought I don't want to read this and see how good it is and then try to steal things from it. I because of that, I watched like all the movies, I listened to all the podcasts, I read a bunch of memoirs, uh, tons of different books that I thought, you know, Gone Girl is, I think, a masterpiece of structure and drama and kind of characterization. Um, and it's not what Disappearing Earth is trying to do. And so it was perfect to read for this, or like reading Room I was like, mm. perfect, perfect. Um, to see how somebody um, uses voice, uses structure, like, and then uh, to try to pluck out certain qualities of that to use in, in this book. That was super, super helpful. But yeah, because of that, I was like watching and imbibing, consuming all these different um, kind of media forms. Okay. And that was really fun. Oh, Top of the Lake. Top of the Lake was one that I also thought that uh, the um, Netflix TV show that. I'm trying to think about, I don't know that one. Top of the Link? Top of the Lake. It's like set in New Zealand okay. and it, it's, it's got, um, it's killing me. Elizabeth, the woman from Handmaid's Tale. Moss. Yes, Elizabeth Moss. Um, you yeah. the mayor of East Town? No, is it good? It is, that's with Kate Winslet. And oh. it's also about, it's, it's missing um, and violence towards uh, young women in a community in Pennsylvania. It's very, it's funny. It's very much, I was reading your book and going over your book again. And then I had just started watching the series and there were a lot of- um, Missing girls. Parallels. Yes, very much so. Um, <sighs> I, I, gonna, I, I don't want, I want to ask you again before hmm. we, um, the name of the organization that you spoke about because someone texted me and asked and I don't want to forget. It's called the Crime Victims Treatment Center and its website is cvtcnyc.org. Okay. In fact, I can put it in the chat. That'd be great. Um, I, it's, it's really, I strongly, strongly recommend. Um, it's a really extraordinary place. And it's free, everything's free. Free resources. Yeah. Um, before we move on, we have we do have a lightning round coming up for Ooh. you. So, um, anyone who's uh, with us right now, do you have any questions? You can drop them in the chat, or if you'd like to unmute yourself, please do. Um, and while you're typing, if you feel free to do so, 
um, a question, just a fun random question, but what is your favorite underappreciated novel? I feel like there are many answers to this, but a what comes to your book, book. First thing that comes to your mind, I guess. Okay, first thing that comes to my mind is a book that I read a couple of years ago. I think it came out in 2018, fall 2018. Mm -hmm. It's called Putney, P U T N E Y. It has a strawberry on the cover. Okay. Um, and it's by a British author named, I want to say Soka Zenovia. She's, I think, Russian British mm -hmm. or British of Russian descent, maybe. This book was so good. And I read it because I read it because my cousin had recommended it to me. To this day, my cousin is the only person I know that's read it. Have you read this book, Putney? Have you? No. Have you even heard? I, I hadn't even heard of it. And it's about, it's about, um, it's three people, uh, two, I would say like middle-aged women and then an older man the women are childhood friends and uh, one of the women in her mind had like an affair with the man. He was, he was a friend of her family's and, and she thinks like, oh, she was, I think like 12 or 13 and he was in his thirties. And she's like, oh, we had this like love affair, this sort of like forbidden love affair, um, this relationship with each other. And her childhood best friend at the time was kind of seeing this and like being not supportive of it. They reconnect, the women reconnect in adulthood and the childhood friend says, you know, that was, that was wrong. Like everything that was happening was wrong. That was not right. That was not a love affair. What that was, was, was not a love affair. And all three of them have to sort of um, grapple with the consequences of this. And, and it really comes to a head and you see you're inside each of their heads with such um, compassion and honesty and it's just like exactly what fiction is for to me it, it it is it pulls you forward it has such momentum and it's so hard and so truthful and it feels so good to read and at the end you think like I am a better I know more now than I did before and I feel better than I did before it's the I was like this book blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote it down. So I was like, all right, me and Nadine, we're going to be looking for that one. <laughs> it's so good. And I think the cover is really good too. I don't know, you know, just so many books are published. I, I, don't, I don't know why some sort of slip under the radar. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm like, all right, I need to take a look at this one. I hope, uh, I, I, hope I sold you guys on it because yeah, I'm just really like, into I it. Doubt. I, doubt. Um, um, I don't see really oh. much. Yes. I'm sorry, can I add one more? Yeah. This is actually, I have it right here. I don't think this book is like totally, I know I know a lot of people have read and appreciated this book. It's a debut that came out in 2019, The Affairs of Pelcons. I remember the cover. Like, right. Yeah. So I think this was, this was more visible for sure. This book won one award or two awards. This book should have won every award. This is an excellent uh, uh, soul opening up extraordinary work of art that everyone should be like constantly talking about. this this should be like the buzz book wow. um and i felt like it came and people read it but it i i everyone should be reading it. <laughs> that was a 2020 book 2019 i want to say 19 okay yeah. 2019 i feel sure yes i i know for sure that it's a 2019 interesting um yeah, because I was like, that cover looks very familiar. Um, also a really great book club book. Really great book club book. Nadine. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, I think it's a Big plug for that one. Yeah. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat. Thank you for putting that link in there, though. Um, Nadine, would you like to time us for the lightning <laughs> round? Yes, and the lightning round, just so everyone knows, is just some quick, fun questions to um, to end with. So. There's a minute on the clock and we are gonna go. Oh, okay. Ah, um, what song do you have on repeat? Uh, I haven't been listening to any music lately. I only watch RuPaul's Drag Race. I'm just watching RuPaul's Drag Race on repeat on my phone. Okay. I should be listening to music, but I'm listening to RuPaul's Drag Race. We'll put the oh, Cover Girl, Cover Girl by RuPaul. That's okay, <laughs> that works. Um, what was the last book that you renewed? 
Interior Chinatown. Um, I'm reading it for my book club on Saturday. Um, bookmark or random pieces of paper or receipts? Oh, scandalous. Uh, none of the above. I'm reading all my books on my telephone. So it, okay. I don't put a physical bookmark in there. All right. Uh, long flights or long drives? Long flights. Long flights. Um, which writer would you like to have lunch with, dead or alive? <sighs> Lots, many, many, many. But right now, Susan Choi. I just read an interview with her. I'd met her once before. She was so incredible. And then I, oh yeah, the author's put me for sure. And then um, uh, I, I was like uh, reading an interview with her the other day and she was just so interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm so into like, I think one thing that I really love about um, doing author interviews is seeing, Hear you guys talk about your work in a way that's like I have a psychology like psychology background, so it's always just yeah. seemed like motives, inspiration, um, yes, soul and heart into that. So like I'm writing down her just because I'm like you know what? I want to I need to take a look at how I got my notes too. Yeah, she, she <laughs> like, so, I, I was like really blown away, but I, I'm also really blown away. She I think I always feel like very, you know, people who are like the masters of the craft would have every reason to I don't know be a little reticent or guarded or why not they've worked so hard and and mm -hmm. like you know they've they've been through the merry-go-round so many times you know god knows i imagine susan choice done a million interviews and and yet she's so um honest and compelling and forthright and and generous and vulnerable and i just couldn't get enough <laughs> i was like flying awesome those are that's good energy to be around or it's to like very good. You know, witness um I think that's it for tonight, folks. Yeah, and there was a question and Julia already answered it. <laughs> She's so quick. How did you do that? <laughs> I know, right? Me and her like, when did this happen? <laughs> that's cool. That's great. This is the- Putney. Yeah, someone did ask, uh, Sylvia asked who the author of Putney is and um, Julia entered it there so you can look and we'll make sure we could get that book for you if you can't find it. And I'm writing um, it down too. Yeah. That's this is the blessing and the curse of, of Zoom um, conversations, right? We have like the whole, so many different <laughs> forms of communication at our fingertips. Yeah. Oh. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Julia, it was a pleasure to have you here. We were, we were, we were so excited that we, you know, we have, we read Disappearing Earth and then just to have you speak about this really awesome, awesome project. Um, and I think that's about it. Everyone, again, please look forward to other events that we're doing here at Oceanside and have a great night. Nadine, do you have any other closing remarks? Oh, no, well, you know, I do. You did mention, Julia, uh, that you watch Drag Race. And we have, we offer a service here at the library. Um, it's book tasting. It's almost like um, Stitch Fix for yeah. books where we can get, if anyone's, um, you know, a stitch fix where you can kind of tell us what you like, fill out a form online, and we'll cut, put a bag together with some books that you like. But we have a cameo with Shangela who promoted mm -hmm. our book tasting. So, oh <laughs> so it's funny that you said that, but that we do. Wait, that's so adorable. I'm just finishing season two now. So Shangela, I'm like right there. I'm <laughs> seeing her star shine. Yeah. I love yeah. that. But I love it was really a pleasure to have you and to meet you and um we you know we're thrilled that you were able to be here and and, and share your experiences with us thank you thank you so much for having me and and thank you so much to all of you for for sharing this evening with me and it's a real gift and hooray for libraries let's thank all support you. our local library thank you. <laughs> yay thank you guys good night everybody good night, good night. i'm gonna stop the recording here okay.